Welcome to the second day of Open Aperio 2017. I'm Ian Dolphin, Executive Director of the Aperio Foundation, and it is my pleasure this morning to introduce today's general uh, session panel. We have Pat Masson, General Manager and Director of the Open Source Initiative, Laura Geckler from the University of Notre Dame, LMS Administrator of Learning Platforms, Brian Ollendyke, Instructional Technology Specialist, I had to use that, and the Elms LN project lead, and David Ackerman, who has a lot of job titles, uh, Assistant Associate VP for Research Technologies at NYU, Chief Digital Officer, and Board Chair of the Aperio Foundation. If you want to ask questions of this panel, there will be lots of opportunities to ask questions on mic. If you're feeling exceptionally shy, and for those watching the live stream, if you use the hashtag OSSValues, I'm going to pick your question up from Twitter and relay it to the panel. But to get us started, I thought I would ask a, a general question. And I want to just uh, pause there to say we did ask for suggestions for this panel. We asked uh, former attendees and attendees what they wanted to talk about. So this is your choice, folks, or at least some of you. So some of the biggest challenges that we face are around establishing connections between the values of openness and our practice in institutions and other organizations. And this usually involves developing strategies around effective advocacy. So could the panel reflect on how this works in your institutional context? Pat, you no longer work in higher ed, so perhaps you could begin by providing some external input on those issues. And with that, I will hand over to the panel and dive down to monitor Twitter. Do you Thanks a lot. Come up and do my slides then? No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so first, thank you, Ian, for inviting me to come and present. And uh, um, I think this, I don't know where the screen is. Oh, I think this is sort of the common perception when we talk about advocacy uh, within uh, institutions, organizations, um, and, partic and particularly higher ed, because there are those ideas of shared values around collaboration, peer-to-peer -peer development, research, openness and transparency in research, and so on. Uh, but basically, the shared values found through openness, and thus by extension, open initiatives yields institutional benefits that helps all stakeholders. But I'd, I'd argue that this is actually a fallacy, that openness is a shared value among open source communities and institutions of higher education. And thus will serve as a driver for the active participation in your institution within an open source project. In fact, it might actually be a barrier. So I'm sure everyone has seen the uh, popular press, uh, higher ed press, uh, advocating for and showing and highlighting the value of open source. And you may have even um, worked with or spoken with some of your peers and your colleagues pointing to the adoption rates of open source across industries and saying, hey, our institutions should be doing this too. And these are a collection uh, that actually Michael Feldstein, I think most folks here might know him, and I put together around um, the values, the benefits of open source, the benefits of open source. And you'll recognize a lot of these. It's customizable. You have control of, you're not, of the, uh, uh, your implementation. You're not locked into vendors and so on. However, such operational benefits, I believe, assume shared organizational values between open source communities and institutions of higher education for these benefits to actually be realized. Again, the operational benefits, these things, assume shared organizational values. In reality, though, uh, open source communities in higher education have very different organizational structures, priorities, drivers, and success criteria. And if I can paraphrase from Eben Moglen, uh, who's the former chief counsel for the Free Software Foundation and the founder and director of the uh, uh, Software Freedom Law Center, um, he says, let me get it right, uh, open licenses are what he calls constitutions of communities that express the consensus of how a community chooses to collaborate. The licenses embody an organization's ethical assumptions even if they are not explicitly enumerated. So campuses who have different sets of values 
look at this and you think of people with budgetary authority within your organization, the, those folks that we're advocating to about the adoption of not just open source software, but open content, open data, and so on, they look at these things and they see risk, right? Custom, customizable, modified to meet you know, unique local needs. Well, that means now I own this and am I gonna dedicate staff to keep this going? Direct participation and contributing and defining direction. I just wanna pay my service level agreement and my contract and some third party is going to help the, uh, take care of all this for me. Right, so all the things that advocates would point to as valuable benefits based on shared values are actually seen sometimes as risk or I would say oftentimes as risks. So what we've developed is a bit of a maturity model here and the values on here on the left, or maybe it's on the left, are, they sound a little, uh, sort of like those posters, you know, like with the whale tail coming up and it says, you know, courage or something like that. Um, so it's not that touchy in feeling. Uh, but rather than starting where we generally do in the open source community without talking about all the great things that open source or open content or whatever, all of those great things and the values that the, that the we see that that yields benefits. The OSI and the work that we do when we work with companies usually starts at ensuring that there's an organizational culture first that allows for the adoption of open source. So things like courage. Does your institution profess interest in the value of openness? Are there people on campus that are talking about it? advocating for it, is there a general recognition that working openly is a good thing? Who, in terms of participation, who can and how can members of the institution engage? So you profess to be open, but you don't let me participate in anything, right? Honesty, is your institution sincere, direct uh, in their actions, and are they free from institutional bias or cultural dogma, motivated by goals and objectives around the issue? or the initiative, rather than internal. Um, reflection, does the institution acknowledge its limits, failures, work, and then work to correct them? Humility, upon reflection, will the institution adapt and adopt new principles and practices? So once you've matured as an organization through these levels, then the organization's culturally prepared. The, the processes and practices and the expectations uh, of the institution are now aligned with how open communities work. There'll be, there won't be a big conflict when, when the IT director or a developer or, or whoever realizes that decisions are making in a distributed way, that development's happening at multiple campuses. So I won't go through the whole list here because that would be uh, too long for this session. But I wanted to highlight that point and I wanted to end with Carl Fogel, who's a former OSI board member and wrote the book, Producing Open Source Software. Um, it's excellent if you're looking to uh, create a project, mature a project, or engage with a, another organization. And he said, um, <laughs> this has a whole new meaning nowadays, uh, the contribution trumps the contributor. And in many institutions, it's just the opposite. So thank you very much. And I will hand it over. Go back to that. I'm going to sit right here. I don't have fancy slides. Uh, I'm Laura Geckler from the University of Notre Dame. So I'll talk from the University of Notre Dame's perspective on, uh, on open source. And maybe it will resonate with uh, your institutions. Um, there are some differences. The University of Notre Dame is, uh, is a faith-based uh, institution. We're a Catholic institution, so values are really important to us. And how might those values uh, at our core match or be disper disparate from uh, open source values? I see a lot of synergy, right? I mean, if you talk about classic values like love, joy, peace, pace, <laughs> patience, uh, honesty, um, there's a lot of match there. But unfortunately, the um, software acquisition process at most of our institutions, uh, al 
although we value the collaboration and we, um, we certainly value social justice and we value um, openness and transparency, when it comes to software acquisition, we're looking for a fit, a fit between our IT environment and whatever, um, whatever need we need to fill, right? So it's maybe a little about RFP processes and maybe David will talk more about um, how entangled those could be and that they're not very favorable for uh, open source choices. Um, we are a hierarchical institution, but one that um, I've been blessed to work at for 19 years values the opinion and the recommendation of the guy whose boots are on the ground, right? So um, as someone whose boots are on the ground, I feel like I have a voice at the table, and that's, that's perfect. Uh, you might think that there isn't any room uh, at our, my institution or yours for open source advocacy, right? And once we get past the surprise that it's actually needed, then we have to say, well, where in my role can I, can I do open source advocacy? How, how would that work? Um, since, since I was on this panel and pondering it, I decided to write emails to our decision makers. And I, I wrote um, Ron Kramer, our CIO, who uh, came to us from uh, UW Madison. Um, and he said, you know, I think I wrote something about nine years ago that still has applicability. So I have, I have a quote here to make, make sure I don't mess it up. Um, so he was asked nine years ago about the place of open source at UW-Madison. So he committed there it's to... Hard. He committed there to a process that gives evaluation of both approaches and even playing field. In other words, open source is not discarded over proprietary software, but make the playing field even when you're doing uh, software acquisition to open source or proprietary, which, you know, I thought that's, that's a good start, right? Uh, if, as a campus, we are willing to make the commitment to fully evaluate our options, we need to figure out how we approach the challenge. As we consider a new need, let's get the right people at the table and explicitly answer the questions concerning time and timing, functionality, engagement, cost, risk, and other aspects of the decision matrix. So I'm taking the conversation here among the panel to a more pragmatic le level, I suppose. Um, I asked other people to make sure Ron hasn't changed his opinion, but keep him honest. Um, I knew I didn't have to do that, but I asked the, his senior leadership team, and they pretty much had the same response. Let's level the playing field, let's make sure we consider all our options, and find the right software that fits in with our environment. If, uh, if an open source or a um, proprietary source of software, has a roadmap that um, maybe includes some feature that we really want, but it's not going to be available for six months or a year, that's probably not a good fit. Uh, I should say we are a centrally managed, uh, have a central IT center, and that our um, educational technologies do fit in there. We have a library IT group, and the library IT group is managed differently. Uh, because I knew that, I also approached them and got a quote from them, which is very different. Uh, and I knew it was going to be different because on their website where they have the staff directory and they list their developers' roles, each statement has, uh, begins with, we support and maintain open source technologies as well as other solutions. So they purposely put open source out there. And this is what I received from, um, from them as a quote. I would say that we have a tiered approach to open source. We subscribe to both open source advocacy, so kudos for the libraries at Notre Dame, and adoption and SAS Cloud First. What that means is that we actively participate in open source development where we can add the most value et cetera, projects that the commercial sector hasn't solved well, or where we feel providing an open source alternative is important. We also look at how we can contribute to the library, museum, archives, community, 
the most, contribute the most, and we do this out of a sense of realizing the values that emanate from Catholic character and mission of the university. At the same time, we try to adopt um, software as a service based solutions in situations where a commercial product meets the most of our needs. And he said he uses the 180 formula, usually 100% necessary functionality, 80% desired functionality. If a commercial pro product doesn't meet this bar, but an open source product does, we would first look to see if a company provides hosting and support for it, and if not, then we would deploy it in the cloud. Uh, he does, as you noticed in his quote, um, he does say open source product. And I think that might be the main disconnect between open source communities and our institutions that are procuring software, acquiring them. It's first considered as a product and secondarily as a community that we then contribute to, if that, if that makes any sense. I think I'll stop there and see what my fellow panelists have to say. All right. Oh. <laughs> That's just the down. Ooh, you are all going to regret that I'm on this stage. Say that already. So, is uh, anyone here an advocate for open source? Raise your hand. All right, we won then, right? This is great. We're all talking to ourselves. This is fantastic. Um, no, so we want to get other people into this room. We want this room to be bigger. We want more people. Uh, so I don't have a pragmatic approach, Laura, as we discussed via email, which she said she was going to mention. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about something called information altruism. And information altruism is the title of my master's thesis uh, work that I did at a certain large land-grant university that may or may not be in the state of Pennsylvania, maybe somewhere in the middle. Good, one person. OK, cool. So they know what that is. Um, so this this place, and we're gonna I'm gonna tell you a little story about my advocacy, um, which borders on activism uh, around a platform called Drupal. Has anyone heard of Drupal? Right. So I'm the Drupal developer in Aperio now, apparently. But um, so in 2007, this is how much Drupal there was at Penn State, uh, a land grant institution. So there was like one group using this software. Now, this isn't to say there weren't other open source communities and there weren't other closed and proprietary communities that were in use. Every one of these stinking buildings on campus is gonna be using a system of some kind, right? There's pretty much chaos in 2007 when I show up. Um, and so how do we go from that to, if you Google Drupal and Penn State, like we have hundreds of blog posts, we have hundreds of modules contributed, millions of lines of code, millions of downloads, right? Where did that come from? Uh, so I kind of was seeing the spread of Drupal happen organically at Penn State, and I started to say, well, let's get a master's out of this, why not? Um, and I came across three theories of organizational and um, information. And so the first one is uh, just a phrase I really love. Uh, I kind of self-identify with this. Maybe some people in this room do as well. Um, it's by Deborah Meyerson. It's the idea of uh, tempered radicalism. Has anyone heard this before? So some people from Madison I know are here and they should have raised their hands because a bunch of people from Madison, Wisconsin called me this. So um, it's basically that all organizations have people with a radical ideology within them, but they work within the structures in place to change the institution or the organization to their goals. Now, when I say radical, that has an intentionally negative tone. That's where the tempered part comes from. Right, so these aren't people that are there to destroy your institution. These are people that love your organization, your institution, but they see something and they want to take it in another direction. A lot of time these people are called leaders and now we just throw them all under the bus as millennials. But these are individuals that are committed to the organization but also committed to something else that work within your organization. Um, another theory worth mentioning is uh, actor network theory. Has anyone heard of actor network theory? It's, it's a sociology type of a, it's not even really a theory, it's more like a concept, but it's basically that everything in this room is influencing everything else. Wow, how meta. Um, but basically, that everything humans produce then influences humans later on, right? So if I write something down, then other people come by, oh, hey, what's this, and read it, and it has the same level of influence potentially as me saying it. Right, so we're able to amplify our effect through iconography, through our project repos, through our issue queues, through our websites, 
through our 3D printed objects, right? And making sure that, keeping this in mind, it's we have to have an intentional strategy by which we pursue open source in a very visual, really slick way. Because you might have five seconds of someone's time to get their attention. The other idea that I love um, from grad school was uh, political artifacts. Political Artifacts states that all technology produced is imbued with the politics of the people that created it. This can be good and bad, right? Politics is to a uh, sword there. So it could be, well, we've implemented blockchain. And what does blockchain do? Well, blockchain takes a decidedly decentralized approach to structures. So then the structures that align and technologies that align with that decision will be decentralized. If we wanted a singular solution, right, if we deployed Drupal or an institutional LMS and it's managed by one group, that's a authoritarian structure. Whether or not that's a negative connotation or not, there's a single point of truth that we're all funneling to. So it's important to keep this in mind with our technology selections and implementations that they do have social impacts on all the people around. And so I would argue through this research and just in general that these aren't just logos, these are agents of change. Um, and so things like Jenkins, especially, um, and uh, a Polymer, and these other, and Apache, these other tools that are, allow you to automate things beyond what any one of us could have done previously, uh, can start to kind of change the equation. And so, what was happening at Penn State when I was there is you had all these people just kind of doing their own thing. And so, by going out and giving away the information of how to use these tools, not the code itself, but the knowledge required to use the code is the thing that really changed the institution. And so now, 10 years later, there's really no question of whether or not someone's going to use Drupal, um, or occasionally WordPress. But um, it's pretty much everywhere, right? And so now we have a whole community of people that are advocating, and it's not in an activist way, it's just we're all moving in the same direction, we can leverage each other's efforts, and that's a wonderful thing. So I would uh, I just, I know we talked a little bit about implementation of open source software and things as well, but I would advocate that you think beyond just implementing open source software and think more about open source as in this room and how we get it bigger as trying to grow a social movement. Uh, because the products we create are ephemeral and they're going to disappear, but these social movements we build are eternal. So, thank you. Good morning, I'm amazed how many people got up at 8.30 to come and watch this panel. I don't think I would have gotten up at 8.30 <laughs> to watch this panel, but... Um, yay, yay, David. <laughs> so, I, I think I have a pretty simple message to deliver. First of all, I'm, I'm obviously a huge open source uh, fan, having been the dissolving chairman of the Sakai Foundation board, and now the, uh, the chair of the Imperial Foundation. I'm obviously uh, not getting paid to do this, right? So I'm doing it for love, and, and it's for love of open source. Um, at NYU, we, we definitely have a very large number of faculty who are open source uh, fans. Um, and in my uh, research uh, technology business that I run, um, we have 1,200 um, pieces of software that we support for the faculty, which is kind of crazy, and like all but 15 of them are open source. So, I mean, we're obviously, you know, in love with open source software at, at, at New York University. Um, but when we pick software, when I pick software, I've been at NYU for 25 years and I've picked a lot of software, um, I don't pick software because it's open source. I have three main factors that I use for picking software, and simply they are quality, quantity, and control. And I'm going to give you examples of each of the three. So for quality, I like to pick the best of breed. It may be open source, it may not be open source. An example. 
Apache web server. Um, great web server. I don't know that that's, anyone can come up with a better web server. Um, but we've been running Apache since 1994, 23 years. Um, it's the best of breed in my mind. And we didn't pick it because it's open source. It is open source, so that's great. But um, we picked it because it's, it, it's a quality piece of software. And that's really kind of the number one factor in, in choosing software. Second one, and I'll use Drupal actually as an example, is, is, is quantity. And that is uh, to say that the software title that is used the most has an advantage over other pieces of software. And there's several advantages. In the case of Drupal, um, if I run uh, Adobe CQ, um, which may be a better piece of software than Drupal, I'm not going to argue that right now, but um, how do I hire people who know that software? It's, it, it, becomes a, it becomes difficult when you're not running the most popular piece of software. So by quantity, I mean popular. And with software, I like to pick the software that's most used because you can get people to support it and lots of other reasons. But the third, the third reason, and I'll, and I'll use Sakai as the example, is control. And at NYU, we've been, we've been running Sakai for a while. We've got, I think, 25 or so things um, hooked into it. Jeff, is that right? Yeah, I think something like that. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff. And, you know, every time Professor Squalachi says, I don't like the grade book, we go off and we make a partnership with Notre Dame and others, and we write a new grade book. And to me, that is the most powerful thing about open source. And people say, oh, I run open source because it's inexpensive. We have spent way more money on Sakai than we ever spent on Blackboard. But we have <clears throat> only 12% of the faculty not satisfied with our learning management system. Why is that? It's because we've been able to control exactly what we're delivering to the faculty. And we've been able to respond to the faculty requests for whatever they want. We've been able to deliver everything. And that's because of control. And to me, that's what Another, that's maybe the most important thing that you get with open source software control. Thank you. Questions, <laughs> comments, contributions? Your own experiences? Or should I go to the Twitter feed? Uh, there's a hand. He's a plant. Yeah. I'm not a plant. <laughs> uh, in my own experience, I find that um, fear and uh, risk aversion are directly linked. And um, someone made a quote one time that I really liked, that uh, the elimination of risk is the elimination of possibility. Um, I was just wondering, how do you balance risk when you're making these decisions? Good one. Who wants to go first? Sorry. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> you can stand up. You don't have to use it. Uh, I feel like I'm then hogging the stage if I stand up. Um, so yes, I, I, I agree. I think uh, institutions are highly risk adverse. And it's interesting that the uh, discussions and the comments on, I think that were offered were around um, assessing tools. So the uh, Notre Dame's uh, comments from the IT department and uh, David's comments um, were about how to assess the risks of the institution on adopting these tools. 
And so I think if I could offer that there's, we're confusing users and advocates. Users are the folks who take that tool and implement it or the end user, right? Those are users. And when I looked at Brian's slide of all the technologies, I was struck that those are projects about technologies. There wasn't the OSI logo on there. Very offended. There wasn't a Perio's logo Sorry, on Chief. there. There wasn't the Free Software Foundation's logo on there. There wasn't Software Conservancy's logos on there. Those are the organizations that are working to instill values so that when you assess those risks, you're saying, okay, how does my organization align with the open source movement and thus with the projects in it? Because once a new project comes on, I heard someone blurt Nginx, right? So now all of a sudden the user is, gonna, is going to assess the tools through those same risk metric and say, oh, it's not the most popular. Oh, it's not the uh, um, cheapest. You know, it's not uh, whatever those criteria are, and they're going to move off the platform, right? So the OSI would advocate for organizations to assess the authenticity of the open organization. So who remembers open class, right? There was a lot. Remember 2012? Uh, what was it? Uh, Lupa Laka? What did we call? Um, uh, we made up a fake name. <laughs> uh, anyway and touted its openness. And every, we got people who were actually interested in this fake thing um, <laughs> because everyone was talking about open and there was this drive for open. So I would say in order to assess risks, don't look at the technology because the, as the last slide said, technology is temporary, movements are forever, or something like that, right? Um, so that, I guess that's my perspective. Well, I'll, I'll take that up. So. If I understand correctly where you're leading the conversation, it's uh, as individuals, we can be advocates. Institutions as advocates, institutions have values. They may value open source. Um, they may participate in the communities, because I do agree with Brian that the value for me as an individual for open source is the community. Um, we've all heard that uh, prof profits are not without honor except in their own country, <laughs> right? I mean, I have, um, I have peers, I have colleagues in the open source community that I can reach out to and they, um, and they know me and they trust my opinion, sometimes to a greater degree than the people I work with every day. Um, LMS team, you're excluded because I know you. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're tight. Uh, so... <laughs> Advocacy is, um, is an indiv I, I, can, I can't see an institution as an advocate. I can see an institution as offering an open, an open evaluation, uh, but they're always going to evaluate a, a product. Yeah, Mike's a plant to me, so I don't really know how to respond to it because he's the faculty member that I have to support. Um, on our Slack channel, it says faculty agitator or something complainer complainer sorry I thought it was more PC than that but um, my so as I view risk aversion I view it through the way in which you roll out a solution and so having top-down traditional deployments of things that can fail massively and cause huge headaches for administration and beyond is not really the best way to dip your toe in the water of open source if your institution isn't, you know, we're all kind of, that's why I did the hands thing, we're at some level biased towards a lot of our institutions are already on board with open source, obviously these two institutions, but so how do you go from being proprietary where that would be the initial thing, oh, that's risky, I don't know who made that. Well, you don't know who made it at Sitecore or whatever, Adobe CQ, whatever that other product is either, but because there's a brand behind it, you have more of an affinity that there's someone to sue. So how do we change that mindset? In my mind, it's at the local level, it's through experimentation, and through kind of organically growing open source. Uh, because then if it's also spreading out risk so that if there are any failures or if sites get hacked or whatever the thing is, it's minimized by the fact that there's lots, it's like more of a mesh network. 
So, um, New York University has been in business for 186 years, and so obviously, um, risk is a very um, big deal um, because we see ourselves being in business for another 186 years and another 186 years, right? Um, and so we are extremely risk averse um, and, and fear is a big factor in, in running uh, the university. Uh, however, um, when I think of fear and risk with regard to software, I am afraid of commercial software. I am afraid of Blackboard. I was afraid of every release they released and every time they screwed us <laughs> with a terrible release that didn't work. And with Sakai, what I've got is I've got an open piece of software that I test and evaluate and help with bug fixes and features. And I put out a great video. Thank you, Kyle. And, <laughs> and, and everybody loves it. And the risk and the fear are all mitigated. So to me, to, you know, when I look at commercial software, I think about fear and risk. And when I think about the open source software, I think about mitigated fear and mitigated risk. Um, so, and I, and I think there's a lot of people at NYU that agree with that. Again, having the control, um, having the quality, having all of the peers, the community, I love the community, I uh, super agree with that. I mean, yeah. Yeah. you know, um, I love, you know, talking to Duke and talking to Notre Dame and, and all the rest of the, the players and not, you know, feeling like I have something that's being imposed on me by some vendor. So for me, the open source fear and risk is actually great as opposed to the commercial software. So we would, we would say that being embedded in the community for us as individuals is a value add, right? It's, um, Absolutely. It, we, can, we can see what the community does together and we, can, we put our hands into the code and mitigate risk, as you say. But the other people at our institution probably aren't aware of how, um, how embedded and collaborative it all is. What, I, I'm still trying to figure out how to up my game as an open source advocate at my institution because I have this feeling that if I were to um, leave Notre Dame, God forbid, and go somewhere else, uh, all my um, tribal knowledge would go with me and uh, the software acquisition process would start all over again from, from this even playing field. I, I don't know what to do about that. Don't leave. <laughs> I'm not planning on it. I love Notre Dame. So I, I love, David, your talk about the commercial folks and how the risk works. Um, I want to sort of spin that commercial thing in a slightly different direction. You know, we've been doing this for 10, 12, almost 15 years now, and we've watched, not just in this community, but in other communities, the relationship between the kind of crazy independent academics, hipsters in cafes, et cetera, and the commercial companies. And so if you look at Moodle, for example, Moodle started out, it had Moodle partners, Blackboard bought up all the Moodle partners, and now Blackboard has this thing called Moodle Cloud, and I mean, 15 years in, still trying to figure out the right model. We in Sakai, of course, had you know different interesting adventures with uh, commercial partners. We have a great set of commercial partners now that are really just part of the community, and that's really exciting. Um, and then the Drupal, if there's one thing that gets people excited, it's uh, talking about Drupal and Aquia after a couple of beers, right? And so um, clearly, um, <laughs> clearly the relationship between open source and commercial vendors around open source is really a subject of you know, research. We as the market are a giant experiment trying to figure it out. And I would then throw out this one 
interesting observation that has been making me scratch my head as I sort of stare at this. And that is, a lot more people go to vendor conferences because they feel that's the only way that they can get input. And so they fill giant conference centers up with people hoping just to like beg for one little thing at a Blackboard conference or a Canvas conference or whatever. And so a lot of people go to those, right? We have a conference where we say, um, we don't have a vendor so much, you're just part of us. You should come and sit around our campfire and help us figure all this stuff out. And, and my concern is fewer people are motivated <laughs> to come sit around a campfire. Those, there's wonderful people that do. And, and so people are like, you know, what? Well, I sure wish there were a vendor that would just have a really big party and I could go to once a year and beg them for features. And so I'm just curious about where you, where you, what you see working and not working and where perhaps we in open source could sort of steal a little bit of that sort of vendor trick of getting people to come to the conferences and just beg for features. Maybe it's a bad idea. I just, I'm just kind of... I still don't think this is a solved problem for us. No, and I love when you try to get me on camera talking about Acquia, Chuck. That's a really good way to paint me into a corner. Um, so, yeah, I mean, how do, we, like, how do we get people attracted to this community? Is that what you're saying? And, and deprogram them of the mindset of, well, I pay X dollars and I get Y. Um, at least in Drupal community, we talk about this a lot more as uh, FUD. Does everyone know what FUD is? It's fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's the thing that kills open source. Um, it's really toxic poison. But so how do you overcome that, and how do you deprogram people of those fears and their uncertainties about open source and the doubts they have? Because it might take five <laughs> seconds of that to be like, oh, we don't use that. It doesn't matter who it is. They're not coming to your event because they're locked into that mindset of just throwing money at the problem. I think we need to do a better job of communicating life after uh, closed source as far as implementation. So there was a, a certain LMS that you may have mentioned previously that may or may not have been implemented at a large land grant institution within the last few years. And um, I would argue that the nature of what people do is then when there's a problem, like maybe say the cloud goes down, that then uh, what does your staff do now that they've been handcuffed and completely disempowered? And they've been, and it's not just, oh, they're not in the code building things. No, your workforce is disengaged now. They are permanently locked into a workflow where they go, oh, there's something wrong. I better pick up the phone. Hey, there's something wrong. Oh, let's send an alert to the entire university saying there's a problem right now. We're on it. No, you're not. I know you're not. You're just on the phone with someone. So, like, how do we better communicate that story? and then have the inverse is, hey, there was a problem with Sakai last week, and here's how we resolved it. Or there was that weird A tag with a blank window open extreme security vulnerability thing. And here's how, here's the, st I want videos produced that just consolidate into two minutes, like solving those problems, because I don't, I don't know how else you communicate that effectively. It's such a long tail problem. We do have commercial affiliates who host for us, and we do get on the phone and, um, and talk to them, and they're part of the community, so it's not like we're on hold listening to Muzak uh, <laughs> while telling our campus that we're on the job on something. Um, we feel like we have partners, and I, I don't want to um, give the impression to, to people that you have the choice of hosting on-prem or or using proprietary. There, there are other choices in, in the middle. Um, I don't know how to answer the question about uh, getting people in the, in the room, because I do think if, uh, if other people at Notre Dame sat around this campfire with us, that they would, um, they would pick up that it's not just pay X for Y, that the community is mo more than that. And Pat and Laura and Xiao Jing and I brainstorm you know, try to figure out, we make invitations to other people, but they do, they do still have the, um, the mindset that we're paying X for Y. I don't know how to get beyond that. This time, uh, we agreed before the conference that we, we are going to take the conference back with us, and we're going to do presentations when we get back of what we experienced at this conference and, and how it, you know, has changed our perception. In fact, this year's conference, well, I remember when I went to the, that 
that big, large, black thing. When I went to those conferences, it was all about gaining content and making um, and influencing right the roadmap, getting my favorite bug uh, fixed. There's still some some picture floating around the internet of me in a bug squasher hat because you know that was my persona at those conferences. And uh, lost my train of thought. Where I was going there? Influ oh, I, I want to somehow take back um, from this conference, and, and I go into these conferences not with what content I can pick up, although everybody who presents does a fabulous job, but more about um, how I catch up with what the rest of you are doing, right? It's more, it's more about seeing what the rest of you are doing because I know that there are opportunities for collaboration that I could miss otherwise, and that brings me back to the conference year after year. <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry. So I think uh, I, I'm playing the role of the contrarian here, I guess. Um, so I don't know why, we're con why open source communities of practice choose to compete um, uh, against... I mean, I do know why they're competing against software, traditional software vendors, because that's where traditionally people get their software, organizations get their software. But why we're using the same metrics and the same arguments and approach. If you walk into a non-adopting institution and say, do you want something uh, better, cheaper, faster, or do you want something uh, that's developed through collaboration, co-creation, and contribute? They're going to pick better, cheaper, faster, right? And so that's what companies, that's what they spend a lot of money, a lot of the licensing dollars go to support that marketing. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't think that we should, uh, you know, putting the conference first, that's an endpoint that requires all sorts of activities, and not just the conference, but other, I think the idea of going back and communicating what's going on uh, from the conference will help increase transparency into the conference, which then allows for self-organizing groups to find affinity within different activities, within the, acti uh, within the project or the community. Right? And self-organizing groups are those that come together on their own, pick their own direction, pick their own outcomes, right? And then those, that maturity leads to authentic engagement in open initiatives. And it's only after an organization has traveled that road, I believe, that they then become engaged enough to go and participate in a conference or make their first contribution, whether that's code or content or creativity, whatever it might be, right? So, until that maturity has occurred, the people are going to those Oracle conferences or those whatever it is because they're contractually obligated to hold up their end of the deal and learn what it is that's coming on the next blind release, right? Because they, they don't have the opportunity of communication, transparency, self-organization, and so on to get to the point where they are now embedded. And now their selection criteria for software is going to be much different. It's not going to be based on better, cheaper, faster. Yes, that'll still be an important because you still got to pay the bills and so on. You're still going to invest in the people that are going to come to these conferences. But they're going to recognize the value of the organization, the due diligence that they've done around it, how that open source community of practice operates and how it allows for them to participate becomes a key driver. Everyone on the stage here has said community is important and they value that. But you can't have that community unless you know what role you're going to be able to play in it, how you're going to be able to participate, how your contributions are going to be accepted or pushed away. So there's a lot of work to do before the conference grows. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just Wait wanted... a second, Mitch. Yeah. I didn't have a chance to speak. So. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, we, we went right. a little different order this time. I think Dr. Chuck's raised a very important um, point that is inherently a problem for open source software communities. Um, I mean, I'm sure all of you, like me, every day I get 50 or 100 email messages from commercial software um, places trying to get to get you to buy something, right? When's the last time you got something from Sakai, right? We don't do that. 
and um, or any of the other 19 uh, Aperio titles. You, you don't you don't get that You're from not open on the list serves, are you? What? You're not on the list serves, are you? I'm on the list serves. Okay, all right. But they're not telling me to buy the software. No. They're talking about other other issues, um, and I think you're right. What we need to do is we need to market ourselves, and we're not doing that well. Um, the attendance at this conference is not is not great, um, and. Um, Part of it, maybe we need to move it out of the United States. Aperio is growing; it's not shrinking. It, it's growing internationally, and we keep having the conference in the United States. Maybe next time, not going to be in the United States, right? That would be a good idea, I think. Um, and we need to have a better marketing strategy for Aperio. People don't know the brand Aperio. You tell people a period, I said, what's that? You know, there's a, there's a consulting company, A-P-P-I-R-I-O, that people know about, a Perio. They specialize in Google and Salesforce rollouts. But us, a Perio, people don't know. So I think, I think you've identified a, a real problem that we have that we need to address. And the way we need to address it is by doing a better job of marketing our conference, of marketing our products, of marketing ourselves. Mitch. So um, I came in in the where the slide was up showing uh, the advantages and disadvantages uh, as perceived by a um, somebody buying software, and I got the had the feeling then that to some extent that kind of discussion is fighting the last war. I don't really feel, uh, having been involved in a lot of choosing software, both in corporate and university, that there's an inherent resistance to open source or free software, but, but rather that the, to the people deciding it, the things that are being listed as advantages don't actually function in reality as advantages. So let me give an example. I've been running uh, on one form or another of an open desktop, laptop, whatever, um, on my, every machine I've used for the last 25 years. Yet as I look around this room, I don't see a single person running a, a, a I see only proprietary machines, all that I can visibly see anyway. And I ask if, for a show of hands, how many people have iPhones in this room? Okay, so. That is the least open platform you could possibly imagine. And these are all people who've heard the arguments about why openness is good. And yet they've picked a platform in which not only can't they change the software, they can't even pick the software. And I would argue that to some extent that's because the arguments that are advanced don't actually function in people's lives sufficiently to motivate them to make the choices that, for example, I'm willing to make and you're willing to make. but. I don't want to have to fix the software. There are literally thousands of pieces of software, maybe more, tens of thousands of software that go into my Kubuntu laptop. And if one of them doesn't work, it's of essentially no advantage to me that the possibility exists that I could figure out what's wrong with it and fix it. And so I think as a community, we, we would be better served having advanced the argument if you don't win with it to stop emphasizing it. Because I think for many universities and buyers of software, it's not that it's a, something they're afraid of. It's like going to somebody who doesn't care about global warming and saying, buy this LED bulb because your carbon footprint is less. If he's not actively hostile to it, he's probably indifferent. And so I think that that there, the sense that I get is that to some extent that this is the last war because people aren't that resistant. You can go into any corporation and say, put up an Apache web server, and you won't get a, a fight about that. But they have no intention of fixing an Apache bug. And so saying that you could isn't really going to help. 
I don't know if that's a question or a comment, but it's a... So I, I have an answer to your non-question. Um, you, you obviously didn't listen to what I said, because I didn't say that I pick software because it's open. I said I picked it for three reasons. Quality, quantity, and control. And in the case of this, it's quantity. Everybody's got an iPhone. Of course I'm going to have an iPhone. I'm not picking this because it's open or closed. I'm picking this because everybody has one. And therefore, I have one. It's not because it's open or not. That's, that wasn't the parameter that I chose my phone by. Where does innovation fit into this? Uh, because I have a high value on innovation, and I want to make a, I want, I want to be part of the group that's collaborating to make the next generation digital learning environment. Um, to be part of that group, I have to, I mean, I have to find uh, intellectuals. I have to find smart people to hang with, to, to feed off each other, to, to move things forward, and. That's a value I have of open source, uh, but but not just open source across uh, across the field. I mean, I don't I don't want to have to manage, like you said, my my phone. I don't care enough, but I do care about um, teaching teaching and learning. Well, and I think it's also important to look at why has that reached the tipping point of adoption in your mind, right? Why is everyone picking that up and using it uh, with an asterisk in the United States? Because it's not even close globally where Android slaughters it, right? So it's because of ease of use and because you want to look like you have an iPhone because it's jewel encrusted like David's is. But um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where innovation fits. I mean, that's also an ideal that you have, right? And how do we get other people beyond just beating the dead horse of this is innovative, this is innovative, this is innovative, this is innovative, but it also, in my opinion, has to, like the iPhone was innovative, and I, did anyone watch the W, whatever that is, Worldwide Developer Conference? I used to remember it's watching those and be like, oh my God, and now it's, oh wow, they literally copied what Microsoft did, or wow, they literally, and it's, but like a year ago, it would have been amazing, like the whole world is amazing and no one notices type of a thing. So, like, I don't know how we get people to realize that it's amazing. But I think usability and user experience is a big piece of that because 10 years ago, the iPhone existed, yeah, but, like, a few people had them, and they were... The thing that was game-changing about it over uh, Blackberries was ease of use. And so I think open source really needs to push into areas of ease of use and adopting... I mean, I think Sakai adopted, like, a bootstrap type of... Yeah. worldview, yeah. right? So that's a good first step, yeah. but I think you need like, especially as you go towards NGDLE, one of the biggest issues with that is you, you are fragmenting your, intentionally in the name of innovation, but you're fragmenting your user experience, so you're not going to get, the even if it's in little ways, right? If it's a home icon that looks different space to space, or if it's a menu icon that's different, that's, in, the user has to figure out, oh, what the heck, what am I doing again? And so I think we've gone from the BlackBerry age of, I have, yeah, I got five minutes, I'll figure this out, to uh, five seconds, I'm done with this, I don't get it, throw my hands up. So I think it's usability is everything in my mind, if we were to move forward. So I completely agree with you. It is last year's war, in fact, it's 2000's war. Um, that list was a list that we all recognize, that I put up, that we all recognize, is this is the benefits of open source. I have a, a, a blog page from 2004 that that list came from. It's got probably 20 more associated with it. Um, and that list was to, in, uh, served as a weapon in that 10-year-old, 12-year-old war um, to counter FUD 1.0. So fear, uncertainty, and doubt 1.0 was, who am I going to call if it breaks? How good can it be if it's free? These are all built by amateurs in the garage, right? All those sentiments, which came out of the Halloween documents. Um, you can go look those up, right? As a way to counter the adoption of Linux um, by, certain, you know, by other groups. And the reality is that we now have FUD 2.0, right? So trying to f go to your, you know, the potential new user or adopter um, 
With those, I agree, are completely not only old news, but they aren't the values, they aren't the benefits that are going to be, um, that are going to engage the organization deeply in the open source project or movement that you're interested in. We need to move from consumership to prosumership, where instead of consuming something and I say, okay, I paid for this, you owe me this, and we have a service level agreement that stipulates what I get if you don't meet that, to what I think everyone here agrees, we want collaborative communities of practice that co-create around shared initiatives, and that the many eyeballs lead to innovation, better usability, and so on. Right, so again, we have to, we're talking about values here as advocacy. What, is, what are open source communities doing to instill the values of openness so that when we do that review, and the reason I use Ubuntu is because I value my prosumership in the community. And I put that above using an iPhone because I'm being dictated to on how I can use the tool. Teachers and instructors are being dictated to on how they're using their LMS if they're consumers. Right? If they're prosumers, then they get to help define the teaching and learning that happens in their classroom. So we have to create the values first, mature the organization, both the adopters and quite frankly the projects. I remember sitting, and this is not gonna, no one's gonna like me for this, while I was working at SUNY, and everyone's gonna laugh, we developed an integration for the Lotus, uh, uh, for Lotus address book. Uh, to push users into Sakai, and we wanted to contribute that. And it was, uh, no, we need to create feature parity with Blackboard first, right? So we wanted to be prosumers, but we couldn't be. And so both the projects have to be willing to go through this maturity, and the organizations that are potential adopters, I believe also, aren't ripe for being active participants until they've matured to become prosumers. Just time for one last question, Jeff. Hello, there we go. Actually, I just wanted to respond to, to Chuck's point and perhaps David's point as well on marketing. I mean, we have, we have all these fantastic developers, professional developers in the community, but we don't have any professional marketers. <laughs> So, I mean, in order to get people here and promote the product, I mean, we need some small investment in that expertise. And, I mean, it is, it is a skill, and, you know, it takes experience. And so I think it's something we need to get people here and also um, to promote the, pr the, uh, the product. I mean, with Sakai, we do have a marketing group, but we're all, you know, none of us are really marketers. I mean, if we tried to jump in and, and fix some bugs, it would be a disaster. Um, so, yeah, I mean... <clears throat> we need that. Um, in terms of why people come here, uh, I would say the most engaging sessions that I was a part of for Sakai were talking about fixing, potentially fixing, tests and quizzes, Samago, and the forums tool, and those were really participatory, and talking about what can we do next, what are some real action steps that we can take, and doing it together. Um, you know, coming here just to consume information from other people's presentations, I mean, the best part of going to presentations is usually just catching them afterwards and having the conversation. So, so maybe we just need more of the conversation, the interaction, user experience sessions where people feel like, you know, yeah, I am actually contributing. I'm not just coming to beg, you know, for a feature or just receive information passively. Um, but, you know, Engage and, and that sort of shows people how they can you know be a part of the community. What's your question? That was a comment. <laughs> I think so. I think from purely like the meta of the what this event is, I noticed an interesting trend in being in Drupal for a decade that it used to the conference used to be about Drupal, and now almost none of the sessions are, which is really weird, right? That you oh, I'm going to DrupalCon to learn about Angular. Uh, they've really adopted this mindset of get off the island, and the island is wherever you are currently. So, like, I think we need to be, you know, the, to the no one is a prophet in their own land. We need to go to places that are uncomfortable. Like, I started attending faculty conferences 
I don't fit in there. I went to a writing workshop conference and then learned that faculty were self-organizing and doing um, their online courses in markdown files, which is something I know that he's been doing and completely subverting the LMS process. That was incredibly valuable to learn and I wouldn't have gotten that at one of these events because I didn't see the real pain points in the way people were solving them. So I think at transforming this event to be a little bit less like, here's the quiz thing in Sakai and more like, uh, we're starting to try and retool our events to be like, here's how you level up. Here's how we get to the next level as developers or as the thing to pursue next. Any further comments from the panel on that? Contribution from Jeff? We're about at coffee time. Well, I'd like to thank all of you for your contributions this morning and throughout the course of the year, of course. Uh, coffee time. Head out. Thanks a lot. Thank